The stories we are following this evening. Prime Minister nominee Lee Won Gu undergoes the second and last day of his confirmation hearing. Opposition lawmakers grill him over how he accumulated his assets. A massive car collision on a bridge in the city of Incheon leaves at least two people dead and some 60 others wounded, including more than a dozen foreign nationals. The United States confirms that another American hostage held captive by Islamic State militants has been killed. The U.S. president says those responsible for the death will be brought to justice. Stay tuned for these stories and more coming up on Early Edition at 6. It's good to have you with us. Welcome to Early Edition at 6, live from Seoul. I'm Daniel Chang. And I'm Nahyun Gyeong. Thanks for tuning in. Now, it's been another day of tough questions for Prime Minister nominee Lee Wan Gu, who is undergoing the second and final day of his confirmation hearing over at the National Assembly. Right. Yesterday, they were questioning about if he was trying to manipulate the media or not. Today, the lawmakers are focusing on suspicions about his assets. Hmm. For more on this story, we have our National Assembly correspondent, Park Ji Won. The second day of the confirmation hearing for the nation's Prime Minister nominee Lee Wan Gu began on Wednesday. Lawmakers from both parties are continuing their inquiries into a series of allegations against the former ruling Hillary Party floor leader. In an apparent show of support for the nominee, his fellow Hanuri Party lawmakers focused primarily on questions about his future policy goals. Lawmakers from the main opposition party, meanwhile, pressed the 65-year-old nominee on allegations surrounding his family's wealth, his involvement in real estate speculation, and questions about his election campaign funds. On the first day of the hearing, Lee was grilled about some of the other allegations, including whether he tried to meddle with the media after he boasted he could pull strings and news media outlets in a private meeting with journalists, and whether he and his son properly fulfilled their mandatory military service. Meanwhile, the main opposition party's new chairman, Moon Jae-in, hinted that his party may not confirm the nominee. He said that even though the party had hoped to confirm him, as this is a third attempt to replace incumbent Prime Minister Chung hong won it might be difficult. Speaking at the party's Supreme Council meeting on Wednesday morning, Moon added that the party will decide its official stance on the nominee after the two-day confirmation hearing that's scheduled to end Wednesday. The previous two nominees both withdrew their names from consideration due to mounting allegations surrounding their past. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. A senior U.S. official says it's President Park Geun-hye's decision and her decision alone to determine whether she wants to meet with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in Russia in May. Our Ji Myung-gil tells us more. U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken said the U.S. strongly supports President Park Geun-hye's efforts to hold inter-Korean talks as it could help pave the way for Pyongyang to drop its nuclear ambitions. However, he believes Pyongyang is not showing sincerity towards positive engagement or denuclearization. And whether President Park meets with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un at a war anniversary ceremony in Russia is solely her decision. Blinken's trip to Seoul comes amid lingering concerns that Washington's tougher stance on North Korea may hamper Seoul's bid for dialogue. U.S. slapped fresh sanctions on North Korea last month following its alleged cyber attack on Sony Pictures. Before departing for China, the top American official stressed the role of Beijing and its exceptional leverage over Pyongyang. He said the biggest instability in the region was Pyongyang's nuclear pursuit and that China could persuade Pyongyang to resume credible disarmament talks, given its long-standing ties. At his last stop in Tokyo, the high-ranking U.S. official is expected to discuss regional issues such as Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. Seoul continues to demand a sincere apology from Tokyo over the matter as a catalyst to break the current icy relations between the neighboring countries. Jim Young-gil, Arirang News. 
And over in the U.S., the Senate Armed Services Committee has unanimously voted to approve Ashton Carter as the next U.S. Secretary of Defense. The 25 to 0 vote signals that the former Deputy Defense Secretary is unlikely to face much resistance to his confirmation from Republicans when it goes to a full Senate vote. A source at the Senate reportedly says the full chamber will probably vote on Carter's nomination on Wednesday or Thursday. The 60 year old who was tough who has rather tough views on how to deal with North Korea's nuclear weapons program will be replacing outgoing defense chief Chuck Hagel. President Bakunin has called Korea's cultural content industry a major part of her envisioned creative economy. She even described it as the alchemy of the 21st century which can generate added value in areas such as tourism, medicine, and education. At the opening of the government's first cultural creativity zone in northern Seoul, she referred to something called Kaldukt, a concept embodying the mix of culture and products derived from the convergence of culture and industry. President Bak says she believes the new creativity zone will establish a new growth engine and anchor Korea's efforts to become a global cultural powerhouse. The government plans to set up a system in the zone for planning, producing and commercializing content by 2017 with a goal of fostering talent and developing new technologies. And local governments are straining under the weight of a central government initiative to provide free childcare to all children between the ages of 3 and 5. Opposition party lawmaker Kim Tae-yeon of the Parliamentary Education Committee suggested Wednesday that the central government should step in and fill the gaps in local budgets needed to sustain the programs. Here's what he had to say. As Korea's tax revenue falls short every year, local education offices lack the budget to fund the free child care program. Therefore, we've submitted a bill that would allow local governments to secure a higher education subsidy from the central government for the program. The issue of who will pay for free child care has been ongoing for quite some time now. The central government says the provincial government are bound by law to offer the service to citizens, while the provincial governments argue it should be the central government paying the cost since it was one of President Bakunin's welfare pledges during the 2012 presidential campaign. Now, one of Korea's oldest nuclear reactors may be shut down forever. The lifespan of the 32-year-old Warsung reactor has been up for debate for quite some time, as it was supposed to be closed after 30 years. If closed, it will be the first reactor in the country to be shut down. The Nuclear Safety and Security Commission is expected to announce a decision on Thursday. The organization claims the reactor is in good enough condition to operate for 10 more years. But residents and environmentalists are demanding a permanent closure, citing safety concerns. Business partners face a one-day entry ban. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with experts on the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best. With Na Hyung Young and Daniel Che. Arirang News. Arirang News. Arirang News. Arirang News. On early edition at 6. And now on to the latest on the massive car pileup involving around 100 vehicles on Yongjong Bridge in the city of Incheon. That's the major bridge that you will have to cross to get to Seoul if you land on Incheon International Airport. Now, so far, two people have been confirmed dead and about 60 others are wounded, including nearly 20 foreign nationals. Police say the accident occurred around 9.45 a.m. when a thick fog was covering the area, decreasing visibility for drivers. Both the weather and road conditions have cleared up a lot now, but there was chaos in the morning when emergency response teams were trying to get to the accident site. Officials say the collision started with a bus crashing into the car in front of it, but they are still trying to identify the exact cause of the accident. Moving on to another story that will make you frown for a different reason. Ultra right wing groups in Japan are going all out with hate speech rallies targeting ethnic Koreans. While local governments are calling for legal measures to stop the rallies, skeptics accuse the Shinzo Abe administration of turning a blind eye. Our Hwang Sung Hee reports. 
Insults against Koreans fly across the streets of the Japanese capital, Tokyo. The number of hate rallies against some 500,000 ethnic Koreans has risen sharply in Japan. The campaigners say they cannot tolerate the privileges, such as the right to vote and access to welfare, bestowed to Korean residents. They justify the racial discrimination as their right to freedom of speech. What I'm doing is politics. Some say politics and discrimination is different, but it's all the same. It's a serious matter that has been taken to the international stage. In August, the United Nations Human Rights Committee demanded Japan add hate speech to legislation that bans racial discrimination. In December, the Supreme Court upheld a ruling by Osaka's High Court, the city with the largest Korean population, which ordered an ultra-right group pay a $120,000 fine for its hate speech rally. But the Abe administration has remained passive, saying the issue is under review. Since the beginning of the year, 24 local governments have taken the matter into their own hands, pressuring the central government to take legal measures. It's extremely dangerous to protect comments like kill someone under the banner of freedom of expression. While the Abe administration turns a blind eye to racial discrimination, concerns are rising as ultra-right-wing groups are planning a large-scale hate speech rally later this month. Hwang sang Arirang News. The family of Kayla Miller, the American woman who held hostage by Islamic State militants in Syria, says they are heartbroken after the militant group sent them information saying their daughter is dead. U.S. President Barack Obama vowed to bring her captors to justice. For more, here's our Kim Yeon Bin. The United States has confirmed the death of an American female aid worker held hostage by the Islamic State militant group in Syria. Islamic State said last Friday that 26-year-old Kayla Mueller was killed in a Jordanian airstrike on the IS stronghold of Raqqa. IS didn't offer any proof to back up his assertion, and the U.S. government remains skeptical about the group's claim. However, U.S. authorities said Tuesday that Ms. Mueller's family received a private message from IS this week with additional information, which confirmed she was dead. Sources who have been briefed on the evidence of death have told U.S. media that it consisted of at least three photographs, all headshots. That said, it's not known whether the injuries seen in the photos were consistent with the Milton Group's claim that she died in an airstrike. Ms. Mueller is the only American woman known to have died in IS captivity. In recent months, Islamic State has beheaded three Americans, two Britons, and two Japanese hostages, most of them aid workers and journalists. In a statement, U.S. President Barack Obama said he condemned the terrorist group and stated that those responsible for Ms. Mueller's death will be brought to justice. This latest development comes as multiple sources say President Obama will send Congress an authorization for the use of military force to fight IS on Wednesday. The president is expected to ask for a three-year authorization. It will also leave open the option to send in ground troops if needed. Kim Yong-bin, Arirang News. He was trusted to deliver the news, not make news. America's NBC News has suspended its star anchor, Brian Williams, for six months without pay. Now, this comes after he admitted that a story he repeated many times in the past about his experience during the Iraq war was not true. Our Yi Ji-jun has more. Brian Williams, a trusted newsman whose NBC Nightly News drew over 9 million viewers a night, is now suspended for six months without pay. This decision follows his voluntary step back from the news desk over the weekend. The president of NBC News, Deborah Turnus, said in an internal memo Tuesday that what Williams did was, quote, wrong and completely inappropriate for someone in his position. The NBC News anchor was put in the hot seat after he admitted that his account of the helicopter incident in Iraq was not true. Williams reported in January that he was on a helicopter that was hit by a grenade in Iraq in 2003. However, military veterans from the incident said that he was not actually on the helicopter that was forced down. I want to apologize. I said I was traveling in an aircraft that was hit by RPG fire. I was instead in a following aircraft. 
But there's a chance that the star anchor could make a comeback. The CEO of NBC Universal, Steve Burke, said Tuesday that although Williams jeopardized a trust millions of Americans place in NBC News, he deserves a second chance. Williams has been anchoring NBC Nightly News for over a decade, succeeding Tom Brokaw. For now, Lester Holt will continue to substitute for Williams. Lee Jun, Arirang News. And shifting our focus back to Korea, more than 34 trillion won, or roughly 31 billion U.S. dollars, is how much Korea's major companies plan to pour into investments this year. The Korean government has pledged to give the firms full support, including special loan programs. Our Song ji Sun has this story. The government has vowed to do all it can to boost corporate investment. Korea's Commerce Minister Yoon Sang-jik made the pledge on Wednesday at a meeting with the business leaders of 16 key companies like Samsung Electronics and Hyundai Motor. He said the government will provide all necessary support to encourage big businesses to plow more money into the economy. Yoon added that business leaders should not hesitate in laying out their difficulties and stressed the government will do what it can to remove any obstacles. The companies say they will invest a combined 31.4 billion U.S. dollars into projects that begin to year. About half is made up from Samsung's new semiconductor production line in Pyeongtaek, which will be twice as big as its current one in Suwon. The government has expedited equipping electricity facilities by more than one year on Samsung's request to speed up the construction. Minister Yoon also called for a corporate restructuring through mergers and acquisitions, citing the example of Samsung selling its chemical sector to Hanhua Group late last year in a bid to focus on its strength. The Commerce Ministry will hold a similar meeting with the heads of foreign companies before the end of the month. Song ji Sun, Arirang News. The number of new jobs added in Korea last month dropped to its lowest level in almost two years. Data from Statistics Korea shows that the number of employed stood at slightly over 25 million in January. That's up around 350,000 from a year ago. But the agency says the slow, slowing growth came from the high base effect in January last year when Korea created more than 700,000 jobs. It added that the Lunar New Year holiday one of Korea's biggest holidays fell in January last year, creating more jobs in the retail and transportation sectors. This year, the holiday falls in February. Finance ministers and the central bank governors from the group of 20 nations say they will use monetary and fiscal policy to boost the economy if needed. This came out at the end of the two-day meeting in Istanbul. Shin se tells us what the joint communique entails. The world's 20 largest economies vow to address uneven global economic growth by using monetary and fiscal policy to prevent further stagnation. Wrapping up the two-day G20 finance ministers meeting in Istanbul, the finance ministers and central bankers emphasized the need for structural reform in boosting the fragile global economy. In their written communique released Tuesday, the officials vowed to continuously review monetary and fiscal policy settings and act decisively if needed. The text made note of sluggish growth in the Eurozone and Japan, adding that some of the emerging market economies are also slowing down. But it said the European Central Bank's recent quantitative easing policy would support further recovery in the Eurozone area. On tumbling global oil prices, the financial officials called on countries to take advantage of low oil prices to further investment. The statement said the sharp decline in oil prices will provide some boost to global growth, but with varying implications across economies, by increasing the purchasing power of oil importing economies and exerting temporary downward pressure on inflation. The meeting of the G20 finance leaders comes at a crucial time with each economy operating under different monetary policies and with the troubles in Greece casting a dark shadow over the Eurozone economy. Shin se Arirang News. Apple has become the first American company to close with a market capitalization of over 700 billion U.S. dollars. Apple stock closed nearly 2 percent up on Tuesday at a record high of slightly over 122 dollars. That makes Apple worth an estimated $710.7 billion. To give you some context, this is twice as big as Google's market cap, 
four times bigger than Bank of America's and eight times larger than McDonald's. Apple CEO Tim Cook credited this to company breaking the conventional beliefs that Chinese consumers will not buy high-end products. Global research firm Canlis says Apple sold more smartphones in China than any other company in the fourth quarter of last year. The British bank HSBC is under fire after a report revealed that its private Swiss bank subsidiary had helped its super-rich clients get richer by concealing their assets and dodging taxes. Reports say more than 100,000 customers around the world rather are suspected of this deed, and unfortunately, some of them are Korean. Our Sun jung in has the details. HSBC has found itself in hot water following a revelation by an international team of journalists that found the bank maintained secret accounts for a variety of tax-dodging criminals, politicians and celebrities. The BBC report says that between 2005 and 2007, HSBC's private banking arm in Switzerland assisted in concealing billions of dollars in assets of more than 100,000 customers around the world so they could evade tax authorities. The revelations show the private bank managed accounts, including those of Saudi businessmen who were suspected of once funding Osama bin Laden, as well as the King of Jordan. It also uncovered some 20 bank accounts owned by Korean nationals worth some $21 million. Responding to allegations, the financial giant said it was cooperating with relevant authorities to ensure its private banking services aren't used to evade taxes and launder money. CEO of the private bank Franco Mora said a new senior management team had since overhauled the business. The list was originally compiled from a massive cache of data a former HSBC employee smuggled out before quitting his job in 2008. As government investigative teams around the world launch their own probes, the whistleblower warns this revelation is just the tip of the iceberg. Sun Jung-in, Arirang News. Hmm, shifting gears a bit here, a night at the opera. For me, it's still an experience reserved for special occasions. can be quite expensive sometimes, right? Well, but here in Seoul, apparently opera has been made more accessible through a trend that's catching on quite quickly. Our Im Yoon-hee has this story. You can always head to the local theater for a quick action film or a comedy. But why not broaden your horizons and check out a live performance of a world-famous opera? There's nothing quite like the grandeur of an opera, with stunning stage effects and rich voices that soar through the air. Now the splendor of the experience is available at your local movie theater. It's hard to get your hands on tickets for local opera performances. Plus, they're so expensive. Now you can appreciate an opera performance at your local movie theater, and the response has been great. The performers may be thousands of miles away, but the huge screen and crystal clear HD quality makes it hard to not feel like you're right there with them. I really enjoyed it. You can see world-famous opera singers for such a reasonable price. It was a great experience. It's a new trend that's catching on quickly, making the opera an experience that everyone, anywhere, can enjoy. Im Yoon-hee, Arirang News. Well, we mentioned earlier in the newscast about a very tragic accident in Yongjong Bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, weather had a major contributing factor to that. Right, the foggy conditions. And our weathercaster, Michelle Park, has more details on what the weather conditions were like during the time of the accident. So, Michelle, fill us in, please. Well, guys, visibility was extremely low, uh, around 400 meters between 4.30 to 10 a.m. And the accident happened during the time of the poor visibility at 9.45 a.m., according to the police reports. Now, most of the fog has cleared down. However, due to the warm air front, mist and smog are expected across the nation, lowering down the visibility. So be sure to leave enough distance between yourself and the next car and uh, when you're driving. Now, currently, the sky is looking 
looking clear except around the southern provinces. And the air quality has also gotten better here in Seoul, while the rest of the regions below it are still in the range where it's getting better. Now, for the time being, temperatures will be mild throughout the rest of the week, but there is high chances of rain nationwide from Sunday through Monday. Now, with that in mind, let's take a look at the readings for tomorrow. So we'll start off the Thursday morning at negative 4 and gets up high to 4 degrees, while Taegu and Busan will be similar to today at 7 and 10 degrees. And to other regions, Jeju Island gets up to 8, Tokyo will be chilly at 3, while Mangkungang is freezing cold at negative 10 degrees. That's all for now. I'm Michelle Park and I hope you have a wonderful evening and back to you guys. Well, thank you, Michelle, for that. And that's it from us at this hour. Thanks for watching. I'm Naehyun Gyeong in Seoul. And this has been Daniel Che. We'll be back with more same time tomorrow. Bye for now.